and uh if possible um don't close your browser window yeah until it says upload is complete understood yeah cool and great all right yeah i think we're good to roll okay this is why i plug the computer into <laughs> <laughs> excellent yeah all right so hello everybody welcome back to psychedelics today Today on the show, we have the author of Psychedelic Alex, Gary Michael Smith, Esquire, an attorney working in uh, Arizona. Hey, Gary, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Lovely, lovely. Um, I'm excited to catch up with you because this is a really interesting topic and angle you're, you're approaching the psychedelic world from. I am kind of regularly telling people they need to go find an attorney to talk to about this stuff. Because they're asking me, uh, can I open up like a retreat now in, in Denver and host <laughs> mushroom sessions? Like, no. God. Well, like, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you can. But uh, how much do you like prison? Yeah, it was it was yes to everything until you said the word mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> so you can retreat. Yeah. You can have sessions, just not with mushrooms. Totally. Yeah. So it's um, a really great role you're playing by you know putting together this huge book this this looks like it took you a while um it and did. yeah well so before i guess we get into the book let's talk a little bit about you sure. um so uh you initially from new york is that right yeah uh let me let me give you the the small little sure. personal bio so I am born and raised in New York, just outside of New York City, in an urban suburb uh, in Westchester County. Um, spent my formative years, of course, there. Uh, went on to college at a SUNY uh, in upstate New York and obtained a, an undergraduate degree in English literature. And from there, went straight on to law school and had had enough of the East Coast by that point. So I actually went <laughs> to San Diego because yeah. you don't have to shovel the sunshine in San Diego. Uh, mm -hmm. so I went to law school and actually went through law school in, in two years instead of the traditional three years. My, uh, law school had a semester system that was a trimester system instead of the traditional two. Uh, so I just banged out law school straight through instead of taking summers off. Uh, and then from there just jumped out into private practice and I've been a practicing attorney now for the better part of 28, 29 years. Mm, outstanding. Um, and what got you interested in this psychedelic topic? Ah, uh, <laughs> I can't point to any one thing, but, but here's the sure. short version of that story. So, uh, a decade ago, Arizona took a second stab at some sort of a medical marijuana program. And it's indeed the program yeah. we have now. And when Arizona started to look at this, and this was back in 2010, there were very few, and I mean, count on one hand, few lawyers who were interested in it, willing to jump into it, uh, and who trusted it. I looked at it, I've always been the guy who's been attracted by the weird and unusual and said, that's for me. So I, I jumped in aggressively with both feet. And this is on the heels of having uh, a very substantial construction litigation practice of all things. I, mm. I cut my teeth in the law doing principally litigation and in that arena, a lot of it was construction law and then just general commercial litigation on top of that. And strangely, a lot of those concepts translated over very cleanly to a cannabis practice. So hmm. um, as a result of this brand new body of law that hadn't even passed yet, uh, I just started to self-educate. And the more I read, the more I got interested, and the more I got interested, the more I read, and it just continued to snowball. Uh, and you know, naturally, when you're reading about cannabis, you do inevitably bang into other plant medicines as you're reading. And of course, that happened to me. And I got more interested and just kept diving in deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden, I saw that, like all of world history, all of world culture had a connection to plant medicines. And that mm. was it. I, I got sucked in and I've been loving it ever since. That's amazing. Yeah. And the thing that caught my eye about you uh, at first um, was that you had worked on uh, a peyote church yes. in Arizona. Is that right? That is correct. I am I am general counsel to the Peyote Way Church of God. And I think I met those folks at the um, 
Arizona Psychedelic Conference in Tempe. Yeah, yeah, that um, was uh, two, three years ago, right? Maybe early last year. Oh, was, what, was it? <laughs> feels like five years. Yeah. I think it was February 2019. <laughs> it feels like eight years back. It could. You know, the pandemic has so <laughs> scrambled my sense of chronology because uh, I have been hiding out in my home office for almost the past year. Uh, so, yeah, you could be right. It, it might have been last year. Yeah, and um, I my table was actually right next to them. Ah. Um, so it was really kind of neat. Uh, so what was their approach? So, like, to kind of get into the legal angle here, like they had a peyote church that they wanted formed and to get standard legal protections, um, and, and you started working with them? Okay, so uh, part of what I'll, I'll share with you is what I know because of what I have learned in talking with them. But in fairness to the question and to your viewers, sure. or really your listeners, nobody's viewing us, um, in fairness to the listeners, <laughs> uh, I came to the church much later in its existence. So mm. a lot of their trials and tribulations, so to speak, predate me. Uh, and in a great extent, um, arguably predate me even being a lawyer. And again, I've been a lawyer for almost 30 years. So the, mm. their, their story basically goes like this. Anne and Matthew, the, the, the two folks you met who run the church today, spent the better part of their youth touring the globe looking for these spiritual entheogenic experiences. Mm. and um, they had been to South America, Central America, Asia, Europe, you name it, and had spent years just learning and, and traveling and, and educating themselves. At some point, they returned back to the United States and met the actual church founder, Mana. And Mana is uh, now deceased. He, he uh, died some years ago. But Mana came up in the Native American church tradition, but... In the 60s, he had wanted to make the church more open to non-Native Americans, which at the time mm. was, in his circles, kind of a taboo topic. So Mana made a decision to branch out and form his own iteration of the Native American church that embraces a lot of the same spirituality concepts, but just opens it up to all races, all denomination. So... Um, that was the founding of the Peyote Way Church of God. It actually predates Anne and Matthew in point of fact. Now, when mm. Anne and Matthew finally met up with Mana, they had set up shop in Texas, but Texas didn't have any sort of peyote protection statute, so they did get in some legal hot water there, uh, which ultimately resulted in them relocating to Arizona because Arizona does have a peyote protection statute. Mm. And who was that, Anna, Matthew? Anne and, Anne and Matthew. Anne and Matthew. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, Ma well, that's great. Matthew and Kent then... and Anne Zapp, if you need last names. Yeah. Awesome. And, and by the way, uh, the Peyote Way Church of God does have a website, and uh, to their credit, uh, several months ago, they finally updated the website. So it's pretty user-friendly now and has uh, a lot more visual appeal than it used to. They, they had a website for years and years and years, but it, it looked like, you know, the kid next door programmed it. So... Sure. Thankfully, yeah. it's, a, it's a little more modern and, and more user-friendly. So there's history about the church on there, contact information, little bios and stuff, and you can read all about it. And do they have any kind of angle around conservation? It, it seems like they are, oh, are trying yes. to do some sort of sustainable Oh, yeah, program. A absolutely. So they, they produce all their own peyote for church purposes. They, they have DEA accreditation for that. Um, they are very vocal about people not harvesting in the wild and, and not damaging this threatened species. Uh, they absolutely have full awareness and cognizance that it's very difficult to grow this plant and that climate change and the encroachment of man are continuing to put increasing pressure on this very rare and special plant. So they absolutely discourage peyote use outside of religious context. And within religious context, they encourage, um, you know, self-cultivation for the group so that you're not damaging what's out in the wild. Mm, that's excellent. Right. And to make it explicit, like the major reason I have for, you know, not being super pro peyote concert um, consumption for most Americans is that it could take away from native American churches access um, because, you know, the stores are going down. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really just happy to see that they're taking that very seriously. Oh, my, yes. And, and they're not shy about telling you about it either. 
Um, yeah. and, and the reality is that, you know, the peyote cactus is one amongst many species that produces mescaline. So you have natural alternatives that produce identical effects, albeit in different concentration. So you don't need peyote per se to get the effects that peyote gives you. You can get it from other cacti. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and San Pedro grows a lot faster, but um, as we were discussing earlier, consuming yeah. two feet of San Pedro is a little complicated. Yeah, and, and um, in fairness to your listeners who, who might not have been around to hear our earlier conversation, mm. uh, what, what Joe and I were amusing about was the fact that peyote is popular because it, it has a natural high concentration of mescaline. But these other species of cacti also produce mescaline, and one of them is San Pedro, which is a very common cactus that you can actually get at most nurseries. Mm. And it grows yeah. very quickly. But uh, the catch is you, you would need, on average, depending on a number of conditions, including the quality of your San Pedro and, and circumstance in which it's growing, you'll need about two foot of it to approximate the effect of, of like what a one good, solid, big peyote would produce. So it's a mm. significant volume you're trading, but for a good cause, because you're helping to protect a species. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get, um, it, like, so they got protection in Arizona. Did they end up getting federal protection? Well, effectively, yes, through, through a number of, reasons. Um, first off, they had branched off from the Native American church, so they kind of already had a favorable mm -hmm. headwind because there are federal statutes that specifically protect Native American religions and religious practices. Mm -hmm. But then they have two additional benefits that, that help them. One is uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was enacted during the Clinton administration, um, which, weirdly enough, comes about indirectly because of a peyote case, the, the mm. Smith versus Oregon case. Uh, and then the other thing that, that protects the church is Arizona's peyote protection statute, which is not unique to Arizona. There are other states that have it. Colorado and New Mexico, for example, have such statutes. Um, so the way that this essentially works is the federal law, and again, this is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, says that the federal government has to employ a, a certain standard in reviewing um, whether or not a federal statute or law is permitted to intrude upon a religious practice. Um, I can go in, into deep dive. I don't know if this is going to overwhelm your viewers. I can. Well, let's try. Of... Let's try briefly. Let's do it in five. <laughs> okay. If we can. All right. Fair. Fair enough. So here's a quick, yeah. quick history lesson and understand. I'm sure. I'm omitting a lot of details. So viewers at home mm -hmm. understand. There's way more complexity than what I'm about to say. So the standard used to be this compelling interest test, and uh, that came about through a case called Sherbert. And for decades, that was the standard. So whenever some sort of a religious question case came before the courts. And we're talking from trial court all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. The compelling interest test would basically ask, hey, government, does the law you're trying to enforce here or the enforcement of the law, do you have a compelling interest that is so compelling, in fact, that it justifies saying to this religion or to this person who is engaged in religious observance that their practice must yield in favor of the law? And that was the standard for years and years and years, and it worked well. But then uh, near about, I think, 1990 or 93, I can't remember which, uh, mm. the, the Smith versus Oregon case came down. And the case involved a couple of Native Americans who wanted to apply for uh, an unemployment claim because they had a religious observance that conflicted with certain work days, so they couldn't work. And they wanted on religious bases to be able to take advantage of unemployment because through their analysis, they, they weren't able to work because of the religious basis, not because of something else. And the court ultimately came down and said, no, uh, there's no compelling interest here whatsoever. And in point of fact, the court went a huge step further and, and did away with the compelling interest test altogether. Now, 
the flashpoint in that case, which is monumentally huge, and unless you're a lawyer or a law nerd, you're not going to really appreciate this, but the flashpoint was that this particular opinion was authored by Justice Scalia, who had a lifetime of being acknowledged as an exceedingly pro-religion justice on the court. And here he was not only wiping away the Sherbert test with his opinion, but also establishing the primacy of federal law essentially above religion. Mm. Um, which, if you know things about Scalia, that's really weird. Um, the backlash came very quickly. Okay, now this is coming back to me. It was 1990 was the case. So in, by 1993... Mere three years later, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was enacted by a, a significant overwhelming vote in, in Congress. And what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act did was effectively restored the compelling interest test, nullified, in effect, the ruling of, of Smith versus Oregon, and restored the Sherbert test. So in doing that, it put the onus back on the government to prove the negative rather than putting it on, on the litigant to prove the positive, which was a huge boon to religious enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you see this translated in the modern day in cases like Hobby Lobby, uh, which came down just a few years ago. Now, you might be aggrieved by, by the Hobby Lobby's decision, but the underpinning of it was that religion won out over regulation. So I kind of view the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA as we call it, as being somewhat pro-entheogen. Mm. Well, that's outstanding. Yeah. Sorry if that was a little overwhelmingly lawyerly. I, I can dial it down <laughs> further if, if need be. So this kind of brings us to, to your book, Psychedelic Alex. I was flipping through the book um, this morning and and found this thing on uh, the First Amendment, like essentially the First Amendment, it seemed to be more related to religion than almost anything else. Um, yeah. The first time I had reread it in a while. Yeah. Um, well, the First Amendment protects speech and religion both. So mm. the fact that they happen to travel in the same amendment, don't don't let that throw you. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I, I just really appreciated your, your breakdown there. And that's essentially what I was picking up from your book this morning. Cool. Somehow, thankfully, I flipped to that section first. Good. Um, <laughs> and, and you were able yeah. to read it and understand it? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. enough. Okay. Enough. Okay. Um, okay. That, I that... think this is accessible to non-attorneys. And, and that um, was critically important to me. I tried like the devil to make this book accessible to non-lawyers. It, it's absolutely <laughs> meant to be a practice manual that lawyers mm. could and should use and have on their shelves to pull off and use as needed. But I tried to write it at a level that you didn't need a law degree to make use of the book. Right. Um, yeah, and that's great. But it's got to be hard, right? Because you're in this uh, attorney-focused world where, you know, everybody's kind of writing to oh, each yeah. other on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> like writing on the outside is going to be a little complicated. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like writing a tech manual for the consuming public versus, you know, the guys who actually repair your cars. Um, mm. Two different mm -hmm. levels. But to, to that end, I actually created this dumb little icon of an exclaiming brain. It's a human head with an exclamation point next to it. Uh, and I pepper that throughout the book where I reach sections where even I think like, wow, that's that's going to be tough for anybody to read. So it, at least it gives you, if you'll pardon the pun, a heads up uh, that the section you're about to read might require a, an aspirin before you start reading. <laughs> I like how I just flipped it open uh, to one of my favorite things to talk about is the Federal Analog Act of 86. Ah, OK. And you've got the icon there. Yeah, there you go. Um, OK. And, and that's an appropriate <laughs> so, place for it because that's a very dense bit of law that has some arcane stuff in it. Did you ever encounter um, like S Sasha Shulgin's kind of testimony around the uh, Analog Act and, and at times when it was folks were being prosecuted under that? No, no, not specifically, but uh, tell me more. I'm curious now. <laughs> so um, I forget where I heard about it. It might have been in his... Um, the documentary film someone made about him called uh, Dirty Pictures. Mm. And he he would be like an expert witness. And uh, I think he had some sort of relationship with the DEA. And who knows how that was really playing out. But they really wanted to get him to agree that a molecule. 
molecule was substantially similar to another molecule. Mm. And he said, that's like such an arbitrary judgment, substantially similar. Like, what does that actually even mean? Um, yeah, and that's so that's at the heart of all these analog cases. Say that kind of thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm not at all surprised to hear that that Shulgin would have resisted the urge to have words put in his <laughs> mouth. Um, yeah. But you, you know, you're absolutely right. That is the pivot point on which all those analog cases turn. What what is substantially similar? You know, the, <laughs> the mere fact that a carbon atom happens to be to the right of a nitrogen atom. Um, doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot, absent more information. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting um, project that you put together here. So I'm, I'm hopeful that people will be able to reference this and, um, you know, hope, <laughs> I think, correct me if I'm wrong, a book like this helps to lower expenses when people want to take on a big project. Oh God! Like, yes. Okay, I want to start some big, you know, thing, and you did the research already. Yeah, well, um, and, and that's how the book came about. The, the The short story is, I went looking for this book, and I couldn't find it. It didn't exist. So mm-hmm. I figured, well, heck, if I'm going to have to go pull all this research, I might as well assemble it into uh, a book and and you know fill the fill the void. So that's how the book mm-hmm. came about. It was yeah written because nobody else wrote it. <laughs> you know that's that's one of my angles often I'm, I'm just hoping people take a project so i don't have to do it <laughs> <laughs> well then <laughs> you're you're welcome i don't want the credit <laughs> i just want somebody to do it <laughs> yeah and um yeah it's really interesting and I'm, I'm glad you're out there doing this um and uh I, have you spoken uh with other kind of psychedelically leaning attorneys about you know what you've done or yeah, yeah, and and that's part of it too. Is I, I hope the book actually creates uh, what I affectionately call a Dumbledore's army uh, of mm. young new lawyers coming up who are going to take this on and bring it into the end zone, so to speak. You know, I'm I'm I've got what maybe ten years of practice left. I'm in my fifties. I really don't want to keep working into my sixties and seventies. So, you know, a decade, I can accomplish a lot before I retire, but there aren't really any psychedelic lawyers yet. I'm probably the first one to publicly come out and and say that I am. Um, And for good reason, Mm. you know, there's really not a lot of business right now that that, um, attracts this. Mm -hmm. But seeing cannabis unfold over the last decade as I have, it doesn't really take a genius to figure out that the law is way behind the curve on this and lawmakers even more behind the curve and there's no shame in trying to catch up or heaven forbid get ahead so that's what i'm trying to achieve here Mm. so i just opened up to one of your grids um one of your charts page 13 here Mm. and you're running through like the um uh crime statistics in Arizona. Oh, yeah. yeah and I yeah. just think this is like a great, great thing to point out. Um, so 2010 cannabis arrests are around 18,000 uh, people Yeah. in 2010. And in 2018, 14,600 yeah. or so. And yeah. like, that's insane to me relative to other crimes like burglary and, um, you know, robbery and even murder. Yeah, like, well. It's kind of uh, like shockingly low murder numbers. I, I know I the. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community.
Thank you.